The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season. Reprove, uh, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to uh, suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is my great privilege to uh, welcome to parish Dr. John Curie. He is a Uh, the Dean and Professor of Pastoral Theology at Westminster Theological Seminary and the Director of the D-Men Program. He has been a pastor and uh, he is a churchman. He was here yesterday uh, to equip the saints uh, here in Middle Tennessee and we are delighted he is here this morning for this marathon of three consecutive services Uh, We promise we'll let you catch one breath and make one quick trip to the bathroom before the afternoon is over. God bless you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, and uh, it is a pleasure and privilege to be with you, uh, to have been in worship with you, which is rich uh, and edifying and uh, uh, indeed God-exalting. Uh, thank you so much to your pastor and your elders for the invitation to uh, be the steward of the word uh, for you this morning. And your pastor has already read for you the text that I wish to address, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll focus particularly on verses 15 through chapter 4, verse 2. But before we uh, open that up, would you bow with me for a brief word of prayer? Our great God in heaven, how we thank you that you have called us into your presence to worship. Who are we that you would seek such as us to worship in spirit and in truth? And in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only redeem us, but open the way and seat us with him in the heavenlies with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Lord, who are we that we have a God such as this who would speak? Speak to us in your Son and by your Spirit through this inscripturated and infallible Word, now speak to us. Lord, we pray that uh, despite the weakness of the vessel that stewards your Word, you would by your Spirit, uh, speak in power to each mind and each heart, illumining, enlivening, tearing down strongholds that may have raised themselves up against the knowledge of Christ and equipping us for every good work that we have in Christ. Lord, uh, that you've created us for in Christ. Lord, where there might be unbelief, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would grant faith. Where there might be uh, suffering and struggle, we pray that you would grant strength. And we pray, Lord, that these, your saints would be equipped through the preaching of the word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
A while back, I was in a conversation with a younger pastor who was experiencing considerable anxiety over the current social crisis and how it was impacting his church. And we were engaged in the conversation as friends and as pastors who I thought were committed to what we were about to hear on the priority of preaching God's Word. Then during the conversation, my young pastor friend made this comment to me. He said, perhaps preaching is not the best way to deal with the issues of today because we live in a gray world and preaching is very black and white. As struck as I was by the capitulation to what, what we, uh, uh, on what we're about to hear is God's primary method of getting His Word out, I was most concerned about the premise. Because preaching, presumably of the Word, trades in the binary of true and false, right and wrong, it's not the best way to let God speak to His people on the issues of the day. Another pastor who of the same vintage who has recently uh, published an academic work or written an academic work uh, said this, the same thing. He expressed the same sentiment. He said that preaching in his very urbanized ministry context would not be effective because for the generation he serves, the Word has lost its functional authority. Again, notice the underlying presupposition in the pastor's methodology. Because... The Scriptures do not have functional authority for His culture. Therefore, what God has prescribed should be done with them ought to be set aside and find some other kind of methodology. As one of my colleagues has recently put it, the norming norm of Scripture has been replaced by the norming norm of my experience and my identity. What the community, what the culture made up as it always is in all places of fallen, finite, fractured creatures thinks is true, then becomes sovereign over what God may say and how God may say it. My friends, your ministry methodology is the fruit of one's theology. What we believe about how God works, how He has said He works, will show up in how we do our, His work in His name. What we believe about the how of ministry is actually the overflow of the conviction about what it is we in actual fact think we are doing in ministry. So how do I help my younger friends? How do I help my younger pastor friends who are in the ministry, training for the ministry? Where do I point them? Well, then I began to think, what if I could point them to a really missionally effective mentor? What if I could get them a mentor who had real ministry fruit in a world that was populated by philosophical schools, promoters of ideologies, idolatrous pagan religious worldviews? I wonder what would happen if I could introduce these young pastors to somebody like that. What would he say to them? We don't actually have to guess. It was right in the text your pastor read to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4 are the final words of the greatest missionary to the, to the leader that he was handing off the stewardship of the church to. Let me ask you for a second just to put yourself in Timothy's shoes. Timothy's a pastor in a city that is populated by philosophical schools and ideologies that supported an idolatrous pagan worldview and social system. He's in Ephesus. Ephesus is so dark socially. That if you read the account of how the gospel took grip in Ephesus, go to Acts chapter 19, what you realize is when the gospel got a grip in Ephesus, the converts who were coming to faith in Christ began to burn their magic scrolls to great financial cost. And the gospel had such an effect on the city that the worship of their chosen idol, Artemis, was starting to decline so that the people who made shrines for Artemis were being affected economically. And so guess what happened? The mob rioted. That's the social context in which the leader of this Ephesian church receives this letter. But then, more fundamentally and foundationally, is actually the spiritual context in which he receives it. So if your Bible's open, would you just turn with me for a second, look back across the page to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, and just listen to the spiritual context in which Timothy must do his ministry. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty... For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, 
having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Mm -hmm. Well, when I read that, I think it sounds like the headlines from tomorrow's Wall Street Journal or the next hashtag Twitter campaign. Timothy is being reminded, and we have to hear this, Timothy is being reminded that in these last days, in the period from when Jesus has ascended to when Jesus returns, that Christian life and ministry always, always takes place in a spiritual context that is morally and intellectually resistant to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. With all of its rebellious, unrighteous, humanity-distorting fruit that grows out of it in families and in churches and in societies and institutions. And here's the point. It's in that darkened spiritual context, that distorted, distorted social context, that this church leader receives this divinely inspired letter. And what's the final charge of the great missionary to the leader that he loved so much and he'd invested his life in? Well, here's what it is. Stand up. Open your mouth. And with the authority of the king who sent you, preach the word. That's what Paul chose. As the, if you look at 2 Timothy, this is the last thing Paul's going to write to anybody. What, was the, what would be the last thing that you would say? Here's the last thing Paul said. Stand up, and with God and the coming King Jesus, as it were, to the signatories at the bottom of your ministerial contract, preach the word. When people are receptive to it, when they're not. When they're stacking up thought leaders that are telling them what they already believe and want to hear. When truth, with a capital T, is dead in the streets for the sake of man-made inventions and ideologies. That's what myths means in 2 Timothy 4. Stand up, open your mouth, and with the authority of the king who sent you, preach the word. See, what he's calling him to do is be a herald. And a herald, the, the, the chief qualification of a herald was that they, one, had a strong, clear voice. Number two, that they carried the word of the master who sent them. Their job was not to go to the town square and negotiate their own message in their own interests. Their job was to take the message that their master had given to them, the king or the master of the house, go to the king's friends or foes, and to announce the message the king gave them with a loud, clear voice. It's the picture of a herald. That's what the word preach. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 means, Stand up, open your mouth, and in this darkened spiritual and distorted social context with the authority of the king who sent you, preach the word. What I want you to notice is that that's the primary ministry strategy a massively effective cross-cultural missionary in a globalized empire leaves with the next generation that he's leading to steward the church. I think I got to see something of the spirit of this recently in, in the, the privilege I have of mentoring seminary students at Westminster Seminary. And I have a mentoring group that meets every week, and I've got first-year students. And one of our first-year students actually has come to our seminary out of what you might call sort of a larger evangelical church, I, I think not far from here, to be honest with you. And as we did our mentoring one day, he told, well, I was getting them all to tell their stories. And he, he, told us, he told us his story, and here's what he did. Apparently in his church, the, what was, he was a youth and music guy, and in his church the, the, the theological maturity was such that he thought, my young people are not much better than atheists. And so he went back to his wife and he said, honey, I am going to teach the Bible till they fire me. That's kind of the spirit that Paul is infusing into Timothy. In any context, in any cultural moment, that's the foundational ministry command. Preach the word. And for the apostle, that command grows out of a conviction about what the Word is. The command grows out of a conviction about what the Word is. If chapter 4, verse 2 tells ministry leaders what they are to do, chapter 3.16 tells us why they are to do it. And when I came to my car this morning, I got to appreciate the, the beauty of the, the Tennessee fall, and there was frost on my window. And I know that that's the case up north where I live as well. Perhaps as you have driven along in the car and it's been on a frosty day, uh, you recognize that there's a little child in the back seat whose great temptation is to write their name with their finger on the frost. Well, that's actually not a bad picture of what the Greek word in chapter 3, verse 16, translated as God breathed, reveals to us. The word is theopneustos. It's the word that we often translate inspired, and that's a right translation and a good translation. What the word literally means is this, breathed out by God. God. 
It's telling us that the scriptures are, listen to this, the product of God's breathing out, His creative breath. They are God's writing from His breath on the pages of Scripture that we read. See, when the word's translated inspired, that's accurate, and it gives us the name of our non-negotiable doctrine, the inspiration of Scripture. But sometimes what we can think it means is that it's talking about what, it's talking about what happened to the writers of Scripture, what God put into them. What it's actually showing us is that what God, God gave us through the writers of Scripture the end product of what God did as He worked through the various modes and means by which He infallibly and effectively led the writers of Scripture. He's picturing to us what the, writers, what, the, what the Scriptures themselves are. God's Word breathed out and written down. The Scriptures themselves are the very Word of God written. So, as the inspired Word of God, they possess His authority. They reveal His truth and His trustworthiness, so that because He is without error, because He is infallible, they are without error. They are inerrant. They are infallible. So in short, here's what the God-breathed Scriptures are, what you hold in your hand, what you read. They are the infallible, inerrant, foundationally and finally authoritative Word of the One who made us and made all things and who sustains, guides, and governs all things in all of history. They are nothing less than the very Word of God to us. So perhaps the greasy-fingered little child in the back seat says, but Grandpa, why does that matter? Well, number one, I've got seven grandchildren. This is how I'd put it. Number one, honey, what you believe about the Scriptures reveals what you really believe about God. What you do with what the Scriptures say about themselves reveals whether you believe that God is sovereign and God is personal and in relationship to His creation has revealed Himself to us so that we might know Him and His will for us and whether He's done that truthfully and whether He's done it accurately and whether He's done it clearly so we can trust Him. Honey, I'll put it the other way around for you. If you believe God would give us something that's riddled with human errors and fallibility and so opaque that only the highly schooled could hope to understand it, you're actually betraying a view of God that says He's content with us being misled, left in the dark about who He is, how we relate to Him, and what His plans are for the world He made for us to walk in. If the Scriptures are not unswervingly trustworthy, clear, and authoritative, you've got a God you can't trust, don't know, and don't have to obey. Here's how J.I. Packer put it. Ignorance of God, ignorance both of His ways and of the practice of communion with Him, lies at the root of much of what of the church's weakness today. Two unhappy trends seem to have produced this state of affairs. Trend one, says Packer, is that Christian minds have been conformed to the modern spirit. But these capitulations of the modern spirit are really suicidal for the Christian, as far as the Christian life is concerned. Trend two is that the Christian minds have been confused by modern skepticism. For more than three centuries, the naturalistic leaven in the Renaissance outlook has been working like a cancer in Western thought. As a result, says Packer, the Bible has come under heavy fire and many landmarks in historical Christianity with it. The uncertainty and confusion about God, which mark our day, are worse than anything since Gnostic theosophy tried to swallow Christianity in the second century. J.I. Packer wrote that in 1972. My friends, the root reason that we are in the mess that we are today with critical sociology, psychologies, and ideologies and what it's doing to our society and what it's doing to our church is this, that for generations our churches and our schools have been diluting and distorting our view of God by negotiating away the truthfulness, the authority, and the clarity of the Scriptures. So that's why it matters. Here's the second reason it matters. What we believe about the Scripture will drive how we behave with the Scripture. In the 19th century, B.B. Warfield and A.A. Hodge defended the doctrine of inspiration against the critical approach to Scripture. And one of their arguments, amongst many arguments, was to illustrate how the doctrine of inspiration had influenced the ministry of what they called the great world-shaping men of the church, men like Luther and Calvin and Knox and Thomas Chalmers, and how they handled the Scripture was driven by how they saw the divine Word. And then what, what Hodge and, and Warfield did was say, he, he, consider how the diminished view of Scripture held by what in their day would have been the progressives 
how that diluted doctrine has affected their ministry. And here's what they said. The, the diluted doctrine of the Scripture, said Hodge and Warfield, has never been held by men who possess the secret of using the Word of God like a hammer and like a fire. Put another way, the reason people in the pew struggle with confidence in the Scriptures for everything in their life is because their pastor lacks the confidence of Scripture of the Scriptures when he preaches it from the pulpit. Too much of the preaching that comes off our pulpits in our nations today has lost the sense of thus says the Lord because the pastor's not sure the Lord has thus said. And may I just say this, you need to praise the Lord for the preaching you get in this church because it's not this way everywhere. Too much of the counseling that church members endure fails to search and heal their soul because their counselor long ago gave up the conviction that the Scriptures are the very one, the very word of the one who created them, who searches them, and who heals human hearts. In other words, the answer to the little one sitting in the back seat is this. Honey, if your church leaders don't have the conviction that the Scriptures are the word of God written, your life will be confused and corrupted by all sorts of fallible philosophies and false narratives about who you are, whose you are, and how you are to walk in the world God made for you. How the leaders of the church behave with the Scripture is driven by what they believe about the Scriptures. And the Apostle's conviction about the Scriptures that he determined to entrust to the next generation of pastors was this. They are the very Word of God written. And that conviction, which fueled that command, that conviction gave him confidence in what the Scriptures could do. Chapter 4, verse 2 gives us the command. Chapter 3, verse 16 gave us the conviction. Chapter 3, verse 15 to 17 gives us the Apostles' confidence in what the Scriptures could do. Why prioritize the proclamation of the Scripture? Because they are the Word of God. And because they are God's Word, they are And I think this is where the battle is today. You're going to have a lot of people tell you they believe in the inspiration of Scripture. They might even tell you they believe in the infallibility of Scripture. They might even tell you they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. The battle's on the sufficiency of Scripture. Because they are God's Word, they are sufficient to equip the pastor, the man of God, to lead the people of God into the will of God in in every spiritual and social context. That's what he says in chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. I have a, one of my sons is a, 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 a VP for a construction company, and since he's been about four years old, uh, what he has wanted for Christmas and for his birthday have been tools. Four years old. Daddy can have a bandsaw. No. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the little tools that was one of his favorites was a, what maybe some of you have this. It was called a Gerber tool. And he has it in a little, and he still carries it. He's one of these guys that when he, my son, when he shows up, there's tools hanging off of everything. And he's got a Gerber tool. And, if I, and I am not handy. I have to confess that. And when, when, uh, when we would need something done in the house, I'd say, Ben, uh, uh, do you have something? Whip out his Gerber tool. You know, this thing can, you can saw down trees with this. You can fix your car with it. It's one tool. It's an omnicompetent tool. So, as Paul passes the baton of leadership to Timothy, he wants him to be confident that God has given him the omnicompetent tool to accomplish everything that he has prescribed and planned for his people in Christ. Look at what he says in chapter 3, 15 to 17. 15, he says, The Scriptures are able to make us wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Because the Scriptures reveal the Son of God who Christ is and what He's done for sinners, because they are the sword of the Spirit of God, it is through the Scriptures that God speaks to dead, corrupted hearers and brings them to life. The Scriptures are able to make fallen, fractured image bearers understand and embrace salvation in Jesus Christ. And I think it's significant, and we have to note that particularly given what he's about to say in verse 16 and 17, he doesn't just say they're able to make you wise to conversion. He doesn't just say they're able to make you wise to forgiveness. That can be what we instinctively think when we read that word salvation. And salvation does mean that, praise the Lord. It means conversion, it means forgiveness. But in the New Testament... The term salvation, particularly for Paul, refers not only to those glorious gospel blessings, but to all that God has done for us and all that He does to us in Jesus Christ. 
He not only converts us, you know this, He not only forgives us, and, and He not only declares us righteous, but He also, by His Spirit whom He puts within us, progressively transforms us from one degree of Christ-likeness to another. And He will finally take us to resurrected glory where we will be sin-free, suffering-free, and Satan-free for all eternity in communion with God. All of those gifts given by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. All of those gifts of God's grace are wrapped up in that term salvation for Paul. And what he is saying to us in 2 Timothy 3, 15-17, is that the Scriptures, because they reveal the Son of God, because they are the sword of the Spirit of God, are able to make you wise for everything that God has purposed for you, that He has planned for you, and that He is doing in you and for you in Jesus Christ. The Apostle's confident that the Scriptures are able to make us wise for all that. Just listen to how he puts it in verses 16 to 17 of chapter 3. All Scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for almost every good work. (laughs) Everything except tough counseling cases. It's not what he says, is it? Essentially, looks at the entire scope and progress of, the, of growing into what God made us to be and called us to do in Christ. And he says the Scripture is profitable to thoroughly, completely equip us for all of those works. Let me give you an illustration of what this means, of the difference this makes in your life. A number of years ago, when I had the privilege of pastoring a church, a young man was brought to me by one of his loving relatives. And he was a young man who was just about to head into his uh, late teens. And he was, uh, had been raised in a family of generations of Christians. Uh, he looked like a Christian, he walked like a Christian, he talked like a Christian, he even smelled like a Christian. And uh, he, this loving relative brought him to me, and he had, uh, he had been exposed and caught in one of those life-dominating, binding sins that young men get themselves caught in. He'd been caught. And he couldn't even talk. He was so ashamed. He was so locked up. And this loving relative brought him to me as his pastor, and he said, Pastor, can you... And so I gave him Psalm 51. He couldn't even talk. He didn't even tell me what he'd done. And I gave him Psalm 51. I said, why don't you just read that to me? As he began to read Psalm 51, God be merciful to me, he started to weep and he started to talk and he started to confess what he had done. And then we began to walk together for a series of weeks through the Scriptures. And I got him to Romans chapter 6. We got to Romans chapter 6, and you know what Romans chapter 6 tells us, that in Christ we have died with Christ, we've been raised with Christ, we have been so given new life in Christ that we can now offer ourselves as slaves to righteousness in Christ. And his face literally looked up from the page of Romans 6, and he said to me, you mean I don't have to be this the rest of my life? And I said, the gospel means you don't need to be this the rest of your life. I'm convinced that's when he came to faith in Jesus. And if I could tell you who he is and what he's done and what God's done in his life since, you'd say that's an amazing gospel transformation. My friends, because the scriptures are what they are, they are competent to equip us for every good work that God has created us for and planned for us in Christ. So I could say this very specifically and very pointedly. That means when we are wrestling with issues of identity and sexuality, We turn to the Scriptures as the word of the Creator who made us in His image, male and female, who gave us the gift of sex in the context of marriage as He designed it and He defined it. And as the word of our Redeemer who in His mercy died to expunge our guilt and cover the shame and heal the brokenness and make us new. That means that when we're wrestling with issues of ethnicity and race, we turn to the Scriptures as the Word of God, the Creator who made us all from one man equal with dignity and equally made in His image, and the Word of our Redeemer, who through Christ and His cross has reconciled all people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And when we're wrestling with issues of injustice in this present darkness, we turn to the Scriptures as the Word of the Creator, who told us that the foundation of His throne is righteousness and justice, and who in His law defines and delimits what justice is and isn't. And the Word of our Redeemer, who has justified unrighteous sinners. Because the Scriptures are the written Word of God, our Creator, they reveal His will to us, and they are sufficient for ministry in our present culture. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way, I do not look for any other means of converting men beyond the simple preaching of the gospel and opening of men's ears to hear it. 
Please listen to this. The moment the church of God shall despise the pulpit, God will despise her. It has been through the ministry of the Word that the Lord has always been pleased to revive and bless His churches. So friends, what does this mean? Well, this is an encouragement to you to carry on, but here's what it means. It means we've got to get back to the Bible. Not only as our foundational and final authority, but as our functional authority. We must get back to the Bible in our pulpits. We must get back to the Bible in our counseling. We must get back to the Bible in our publications. We have to get back to the Bible in our church assemblies. Because it is the divinely inspired and empowered word to thoroughly equip His people for every good work that God has entrusted to us in Christ comes until Christ comes again. The Scriptures have the priority, the power, the sufficiency to equip us to speak, to stand, to serve in ministry in the culture, because they are the Word of God. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.